Good evening, everyone. I'd like to first thank everybody that played a, a large role in making tonight happen. There are uh, many people that spent hours to try to uh, organize the event in order to make it very helpful and educational um, for, for everybody. Um, I want tonight to be fairly casual, uh, informative. I want this to be an interactive discussion. So if at any time you have any questions, issues, concerns, raise your hand, yell at me, throw something, um, whatever it takes. Um, but I hope this to be uh, educational, but also fun, enjoyable, and uh, not too dry. Um, special thanks to uh, our nurse practitioner, Erin, who is her birthday today, and she is sacrificing her birthday <laughs> to be here with us. So thank you, Erin, for putting together tonight and helping, and also all that you do on a daily basis. So tonight, folks uh, primarily want to focus on knee and hip replacement, although there are many other joint replacements. These are the two most common. This is a brief overview. I want to talk about arthritis in general, how to diagnose, different treatment options other than surgery, because oftentimes arthritic symptoms are able to be controlled without having to have a joint replacement. Talk about current ideas or concepts in joint replacement, and then the primary focus on hip and knee replacement tonight. This is a graph uh, looking at the total number of knee replacements in the United States. And the light blue line initially is what has been done up to 2013. And you can see the red line is the progression and the estimates of the number of total knee replacements that are going to be needed to be done in the United States. So you can see there's going to be a huge increase and a huge demand. And so because of this, we are trying to make our surgical procedures better and try to make sure the outcomes are optimal uh, for our patients. So there's extensive amount of research um, in joint replacement as well as protocols to make the whole procedure um, better for everyone. So 51 million Americans with arthritis, a huge number. It's a huge burden on our healthcare system and our, our economy. Um, Overall, it's a generalized inflammation in the joints, pain, stiffness, swelling. It's typically worse with overall activities. There are many overall causes of arthritis. Some come after a fracture. If you have a broken bone that extends into the joint, that can lead to arthritis in the future. Osteoarthritis is the most common. And in the past, we always thought this was a wear and tear or an overuse phenomenon of the joints. Well, more research has been done, and we realize that there's actually more to it than just wear and tear of the joints. There are some biologic issues, there are some chemical issues that lead to the arthritis. Um, another very common issue is somebody that would potentially have a knee scope with a meniscus that's debrided at a young age. That meniscus serves as a cushion. With that meniscus gone or a part of it gone, that really increases the risk of developing arthritis in the future. And another subcategory of arthritis is inflammatory or rheumatoid arthritis um, that can lead to wear of the joint and cause pain and activity limitation. These are some just brief pictures of knee arthritis. Uh, on the one side is x-rays. On the left with the arrows, you can see that there's joint space that's well maintained. You can see here there's space. That shows cartilage. And you can see the x-rays here with a severely arthritic joint, no cartilage left. This is severe arthritis. This is basically a, a diagram of the similar phenomenon that shows the cartilage wear, the joint space loss. That leads to pain, stiffness, difficulty moving your joint, as well as swelling. You can see bone spurs as well. Bone spurs are common with osteoarthritis. And what happens essentially is the bone the, you lose the cartilage, you lose the cushion, so the body's response is to make bone to try to add more cushion. Well, it's not effective cushion. It causes more pain. That's what causes the bone spurs. So typically the bone spurs aren't the issue. It's typically what we see as a result of, of the arthritis. Some of the similar pictures with hip arthritis show similar. Um, you see the normal joint space here. Nice round hip with the space. That's good, healthy cartilage. And you can see in this view here, that cartilage is worn. And it's essentially, in this picture, bone on bone. Similar phenomenon that you see in the knee, we see in the hip as well, where you can have bone spurs. Um, you can have loss of that cartilage, which causes pain and stiffness. 
in the hip. So overall, diagnosis. Uh, oftentimes, there's, there's not an injury. It's just uh, over time, soreness, stiffness, achiness. Occasionally, there's an injury that causes the pain, but the arthritis has been existing for a period of time. That injury is just what pushed um, the person over the edge to get those symptoms. It's usually a dull, aching pain that's activity related. And for arthritis, the diagnosis is history, basic physical examination, um, but x-rays are the most helpful. Um, oftentimes, once arthritis gets to be severe, CT scans and MRIs aren't very helpful because we are able to make that diagnosis and treatment decisions based on the exam, history, and the x-rays. That uh, it's fairly common, certain people will get MRIs, but the diagnosis is really not required to have the MRI or the CT scan. X-rays, exam, are, are very, very helpful for that. So obviously the goal of treatment of arthritis is to have you return to your normal activities, do those things that you enjoy doing. And if we can do that with modifying your activity or exercising, um, strengthening, that's the ideal goal because you can get back to those activities without surgery. So those are what we usually try first. Um, those methods, methods as well as, as weight loss. It's always a challenge for people if you're trying to lose weight and your joints hurt, how, how do you do that? So there's ways that are non-impact, exercise, swimming, biking, elliptical, and there's ways in addition to diet modifications where you can lose weight that oftentimes you take the pressure off the joints, although that doesn't cure the arthritis, that improves the symptoms related to the arthritis. Physical therapy plays a critical role in this. By strengthening the muscles around the joint and restoring the motion, that really improves with the symptoms and improves the overall function uh, of the joint. Um, bracing has been shown in some cases to help the symptoms. Um, it doesn't, again, improve the arthritis itself, but it helps the overall function. And then medications are, are options as well. Um, Tylenol and anti-inflammatories are initially the first line of, of treatments over the counter if medically able. And then there are prescription options at that point. Certain people have limitations for medical reasons where they aren't able to take anti-inflammatories. So it's important to have that discussion with your primary care provider to make sure that certain anti-inflammatories are safe um, and wouldn't cause any issues with anticoagulation, blood thinners, or if you have stomach issues, or um, potentially any other contraindication to those anti-inflammatories. Uh, tramadol is another pain medication that's not a uh, narcotic but is a little bit stronger that occasionally is used for management of pain associated with the arthritis. And again, it's important to emphasize that all these treatments, they're only helping the symptoms related to the arthritis. They're not actually curing the arthritis. There's no way that we know at this point to actually reverse the arthritis or the change in the joints. So if the medications, physical therapy, activity modification aren't helping, the next step are typically injections. And the two basic kinds that are utilized are steroid injections and visco supplementation. Steroid injections are the most common and have been used for years. And steroids are just very, very strong anti-inflammatories. So instead of taking anti-inflammatories via mouth, the steroids are actually injected into the affected joint and act as very strong um, anti-inflammatories. <coughs> there are limitations with steroids. Again, as I mentioned, it doesn't reverse the arthritis. Um, and in patients that are diabetic, the steroid injections can actually increase blood sugars temporarily. So that's something we often caution patients about. And there are also limited number of times a year you can have those injections. Every physician is different, but typically three to four times a year would be the most that somebody would typically get a steroid injection. The other negative is over time, the steroids tend to lose their effectiveness. Um, but it is a definitely an option for uh, arthritis. Steroids are much more effective in the knee than the hip. With hip injections, it's not uncommon to have the injections last less than a month. So more common in the knees, more effective, last longer. The other downside to the injections in the hip is that the hip injections typically aren't given in clinic because the hip is a deep, smaller joint. We would coordinate with a radiologist or a physical medicine and rehabilitation specialist to do that injection 
under x-ray guidance to make sure that the injection goes exactly where we would want it to do or want it to go. Um, the other injection, visco supplementation, uh, it's hyaluronic acid, which is actually one of the building blocks of cartilage. Um, some people will call this the rooster comb injection because it was typically initially derived from rooster comb. Um, we used to think that this was more of a lubricating injection because it's kind of a thick, viscous gel. We've kind of realized now it's not necessarily lubricating, but it also has some anti-inflammatory properties as well. Um, we do these injections. We used to do them much more frequently. We've backed off a little bit. Some recommendations thought it wasn't as effective, especially for severe arthritis, but we're starting to do them a little bit more. We typically have to get insurance approval for non-Medicare patients as well for this. Just one extra little step, but we do do it. And it's a good option for patients, especially with mild to moderate arthritis, or people that just aren't ready for surgery uh, at that point. And we can also alternate. We'll do a steroid and then a gel injection. Uh, alternating uh, to that point. So those with pretty solid evidence, and these are based on American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeon recommendations. They've had large committees that have gotten together and figured out what really works, and there's good data to support, what sort of works or may work, and what doesn't work at all. And so this is a category that has some data, some studies show that it works, some don't. Um, electrotherapeutic treatment, these are TENS units. Some studies show them to be helpful. Others don't. Uh, manual therapy, unloading braces that take the pressure off certain areas of the arthritic joint. Again, there's limited evidence. We typically don't prescribe opioids for arthritis. Um, we will do that occasionally, we will do that postoperatively, but before surgery, uh, more and more studies are showing that it's not effective to give opiates for arthritic pain. Um, one, it's not as effective. Two, everybody's concerned about addiction and the opiate crisis. But another concern we have is people that are on opiates before surgery have poorer outcomes after surgery, and we have a harder time controlling pain afterwards. So we really try to avoid opi opiates for arthritis itself. And then limited evidence for growth factor or platelet-rich plasma injections. And uh, platelet-rich plasma, basically take your blood, you spin it down, and then you inject it into the joint. <coughs> some studies show that this is helpful for mild arthritis. Some don't. The big concern here for stem cells and platelet-rich plasma is, one, there's limited evidence. There's tons of research, and uh, eventually, you know, years in the future, this may be the standard of care. But we just don't really know at this point. Insurance doesn't cover it. So that's, if there's no evidence and insurance doesn't cover it, it's not a typical frontline treatment for it. Although there are providers that will perform stem cell or platelet-rich plasma injections, just know that it can be thousands and thousands of dollars with limited evidence. And so as long as patients are aware of the pros and cons and the risk benefits, um, and this is based on recommendations from the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, again, that uh, tons of research, it's hopeful, it's promising, but there's just not conclusive data, especially to justify spending five, ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars for those injections, especially if you have severe, severe arthritis. And these are some studies that have been shown not to be, or uh, techniques that have been shown not to be effective. Although there's always anecdotal, this is again based on large scale studies. Um, acupuncture, glucosamine and chondroitin, um, as well as knee arthroscopy. And this, in the past, was a frontline treatment of arthritis. People had arthritis with a meniscus tear that was degenerative. They would get a knee scope, and they felt great for a few weeks or a few months. But then once the chemicals from the arthritis built back up, their symptoms were, were back again. And something important to note about this, if you get an MRI with, on any knee with severe arthritis, or even moderate arthritis, almost everybody's going to have a meniscus tear. The meniscus, which is a cushion, just because the joint is irregular and rough, it's going to tear the meniscus. We focus our treatment on the arthritis, not the meniscus, because the arthritis is the underlying problem. So in the past, we used to do knee scopes for arthritis. Now we don't. It's not recommended. It's not supported by evidence. Um, and most insurance companies, Medicare, won't support it for basis on arthritis alone. So the big question is, is when, when is it time 
if you have severe arthritis, when, when is it your time to get your joint replacement? This is a picture of Bill Steele. Uh, he was one of my patients in Alaska that I did a knee replacement on. And I saw him for four years before he had a knee replacement. He had treatment before that, before. And he had all the treatments we've talked about before. He had medications. He modified his activities. He lost weight. He had exercise. And he was able to get by. He had pain, but he just kept getting by, kept getting by, kept getting by. And it got to the point where he couldn't do the things he enjoyed. And every fall, he went on a caribou hunt uh, in the back country in, in Alaska. And when it got to the point where he was concerned that he could no longer do his hunts, what he loved, he's like, all right, doc, it's time. So that was his issue. That's what finally pushed him over the top to getting his knee replacement. Everybody's different. Some people, it's, hey, I can't play with my grandkids anymore. I, I can't do my job in the factory anymore. Um, I can't go to Iowa football games in the fall. I can't get up the stairs because my knee hip hurts or my hip hurts. That's when it's time, when everything's failed, you're not happy with your quality of life, you have severe arthritis, that's when you have that discussion with your surgeon about, hey, maybe it's time for me. And everybody's, everybody's different, but uh, those are the, the considerations. Severe symptoms despite treatment, the quality of life, can't sleep, can't get around. Um, then it's the education. You know, talk it over with, with your surgeon, your primary care provider, when you feel that it's something that you're interested in considering. Some surgeons have age restrictions. The national guidelines, there really aren't any age restrictions. It's just a personal discussion with, with your surgeon. Um, obviously, if you have your joint replacement when you're younger, it's likely to, to wear out. But my personal feeling is, if you're going to have a decreased quality of life 15, 20 years, why put up with that till you get to a certain age, till you're 50, 60, whatever arbitrary number? As long as you have a discussion and realize that hey, I'm getting this joint done at an early age, that's fine, it may wear out, but hey, I'm able to get 15, 20 years of doing the things I love. So that's something to, important to consider rather than an arbitrary, hey, I turned 50, now I can get my total knee. Um, there, there's no real set time frame, so that's just a discussion with, with your surgeon. Um, one thing to mention with the steroid injection I didn't talk about earlier is the current recommendation is waiting at least 90 days from your last steroid injection until you have that joint replaced. More studies are showing that if you have that injection and surgery within 90 days, the risk of infection is significantly higher. So we want to have that at least 90 day minimum window before, between the last steroid injection and surgery. This is uh, the Bill. This is at uh, a caribou hunt. He was so happy. He was able to let me tag along uh, on a caribou hunt after his knee replacement. So here he is, the Alaska tundra, hiking around, pretty happy. So more and more, we're realizing that, you know, obviously, joint replacement is a significant surgery with risk. And we're trying to find ways to minimize the risk of surgery and improve outcomes. Um, and so we've realized that by improving the health before surgery of the patient and the medical status, the outcomes of surgery are better. So once we decide, hey, surgery is a good option. You'll meet with your primary care provider, either an MD, DO, PA, nurse practitioner, and that provider will go over the medical status. You'll do labs, you'll do EKG, any specialized studies. Um, more and more of our complications we're realizing are due to medical factors that can be modified before surgery. And so these are the big things that we're looking at right now. Weight, diabetes, and smoking. And these are the current general guidelines um, for weight, a BMI below 40. That's basically a measure of your weight and height. And then for patients with diabetes, the A1C below 8. And obviously it's better if they're lower, but this is sort of the generalized cutoff for weight and A1C. Um, certain centers across the country, not in Iowa, but other states, this is even lower. BMIs of 35, A1C is 7.5 or 7. And I, I believe over time these are going to continue to decrease because we realize that a majority of the complications we see are in patients that BMIs were a little high, diabetes were a little high, maybe smoke. And so these are all m risk factors that we can modify. And it's very common for, for me to see patients in clinic with A1Cs uh, above 8. And those patients with Unity Point, there's a specific protocol that 
with endocrinology, primary care, a specific tailored protocol to get the A1C down to a safe level. That has been working very well. And it's not uncommon to see patients with a BMI below, uh, above 40, and they feel very frustrated. Like, I, there's no way. How can I lose weight if my weight is so high? <coughs> Every week I see patients that initially were high, and they can get down there. So I know it can be done. I mean, patients in this room now that are my patients that I've seen that were BMIs were 45, 50, 55, and they, they can do it. So it's easy to feel frustrated, but believe me, with the proper help from nutrition, endocrinology, primary care, and the motivation that you can, if you are above that level, get to a safe level. Um, again, it doesn't eliminate the risk of complications, but it's modifiable and something we can definitely do and get down to a safe level. So as Jen mentioned earlier in the introduction, she went through a whole list of people, and it's very, very true that this isn't just the patient alone or patient and the surgeon. There are multiple players involved in the success of a total joint. Um, initially, it's the patient and that mindset and that motivation and the willingness to undergo a surgery and recover. Obviously, a well-trained surgeon, but we all work together as a team, and if one step of the way, one teammate falls down, doesn't work, then the whole, whole thing falls apart. So we really rely on the entire team to, in order to have a successful outcome. Um, you know, physical therapy was mentioned before. The whole clinic staff, you know, my staff at PCI, we've got nurses, we've got techs, we've got schedulers, um, we've got a whole host of people as an outpatient prior to surgery. The primary care provider has people as well. And then in the OR, you've got anesthesia, we've got OR nurses, OR techs, we've got industry representatives. Everybody plays an important role into having a, a good outcome. Um, and I also put a lot of responsibility as a total joints and elective surgery. To have a plan for yourself after surgery, have your family support, have your friends, have a plan in order to have a good recovery um, you know, during surgery and then after surgery because it's very critical in order to have a good outcome. Because recovery after a total joint can be months. And so having that emotional support, that physical support, really goes a long way in order to have a su successful total joint. So Jen went over some of the basic um, procedures, and I won't go into to detail. You know, basically, you check in, you get your IV, you meet anesthesia. And I want to say that we're very fortunate in Cedar Rapids to have really tremendous anesthesiologists and anesthesia nurses here. Um, I've practiced medicine in the Air Force and other places throughout my career. We're really lucky to have a top-notch anesthesia crew um, in, in Cedar Rapids. Um, surgeon will mark your knee or your hip before surgery. Um, most people are concerned uh, with, with anesthesia and getting nervous. They'll give you sedation. Um, you have your surgery, go up to the four center floor, have your recovery, work with physical therapy, and then discharge. And I kind of glossed over some things and I'll hit some other things as we go along. Um, one of the biggest changes in joint replacement over the last five to 10 years isn't necessarily the implants or um, the techniques. It's more of the protocols we do before and after surgery to make it a better experience for patients. Um, you'll get multiple medications before surgery and it's a lot of different types of medications to have in your system to make your surgery better and then your recovery better. So it's a lot of different things like Tylenol, you have an anti-inflammatory, uh, oftentimes a low level uh, narcotic to have in your system, nausea medication, and then a medication called TXA which helps decrease the blood loss and it's nearly eliminated blood transfusion with joint replacement. So by doing all of these ahead of time in coordination with anesthesia to give low level sedation, um, goes a long ways to having better recovery, quicker recovery, less pain, less nausea. Uh, the injection that, that I mentioned, a couple different things. For knee replacements, we often do what's called an adductor canal block. Using ultrasound, this is a, a picture here. Using an ultrasound, find the nerve and they inject local anesthetic by the nerve that helps numb up the leg before surgery. And then we try as possible to do a spinal anesthetic. Most people are concerned, hey, I don't want a needle in my back. It's, it's very intimidating, very scary. Um, most people that have gone through it, and some of you in the room have probably got, gone through it as well, it, it, it's very safe, effective, and most people don't even remember that they had the 
um, the spinal place. Um, they usually go back, have the spinal, and then wake up um, in recovery. And that really decreases the risk of blood clot, nausea, and other complications after the surgery. Um, this is uh, a picture intraoperatively in surgery that there's a mixture of local anesthetic and other medications that we do during surgery to decrease the pain afterwards and then decrease the amount of narcotics we need afterwards. Um, some people don't require any narcotics after surgery. And so they feel better, get moving quicker, and then get out of the hospital and back to their, their ho home uh, quicker. Um, so overall, this is tough, and I don't want to get into tons of specifics about the different types of surgery. Um, with, with knee replacement, uh, often people think of you know, you're taking big chunks of bone and replacing it with these huge metal pieces and hinges. And um, really, it's a resurfacing procedure where we just shave off the very, very edges of the bone, the arthritic part, portion of the bone. And it's like a cap on either end. And so you can see it's a metal cap here and then a metal cap here with a plastic um, called polyethylene in between. And we use some special type of cement to go in between. And this is just another angle. And you can see the side view shows very well that it's just a cap underneath the kneecap, a little piece of plastic, and then just a little bit of uh, metal on top. So this very small amount of bone um, is resected with the knee replacement. Um, knee replacement surgery is, is a good surgery. It's very reliable. Um, it never feels like a normal, natural knee like you were 25 again. Um, it hurts to kneel even after surgery. Um, and the recovery for knee replacement, it, it takes a long time. I tell my patients it's you know, 10, 12, 14 months before you're really optimized where you want to be after a knee replacement. Total hip ar uh, replacement, on the other hand, is one of the most successful surgeries we have. After a while, people tend to forget that they had the surgery. They may have some mild aches and pains occasionally, but after recovery, um, overall, if you look at the studies, people are much more satisfied in general with the hip replacement rather than um, a knee replacement. Um, overall, uh, with the hip replacement, this shows the overall um, post-operative x-rays of replacing the ball, uh, replacing the socket um, with the stem that the bone actually grows into. And the hip's held into place um, using muscle and the overall shape uh, of the socket. This is a, a good schematic of um, a hip replacement here. That you can see that the, the bone is actually cut here, shaved here. The stem goes down with the, the ball here. Um, physical therapy for knee replacement is intense, um, you know, two to three times a week for multiple weeks whereas physical therapy for the hip uh, is fairly minimal. There are some exercises, um, but it's not nearly as intense as the, uh, the knee replacement. The goal is quick mobility with, with any type of joint replacement. Return back to your normal lifestyle, but also the quicker you move, the decreased chance of having complications such as uh, blood clots, infections, pneumonia, um, and plus overall well-being by increasing uh, the range of motion. Correct. Yeah, the goal is day of surgery to walk. So as soon as the spinal anesthetic wears off, usually a few hours after surgery, with knee and hip replacement surgery, get up out of the hospital bed, walk around with a walker and physical therapy assistance um, to get back moving. Uh, granted, you're going to increase your activity as tolerated, um, but the quicker you get on your feet, the better you're going to do. How long before you can go downstairs? Uh, the day of surgery. Depending on when your spinal wears off, but the goal is, you know, a number of patients will go home the day of surgery, um, if not a lot of people the next morning. And so if your surgery is in the morning and you're medically doing well, you'll go home that evening. Um, physical therapy will work with you that day to walk and also do the stairs to make sure that you're safe. I mean, we're not going to say, hey, uh, you're, see you, go home, figure it out. As long as you're safe and medically stable, Thank you. yeah, yeah, you're going you're gonna to go home. Um, and yeah. And most patients that we've been doing this program for about a year, uh, the patients that have been medically able and had the support at home have loved being able to get in their own bed that night, you know, have the support system, have their own food, um, don't have annoying doctors coming in and bugging them in the middle of the night, or nurses too. Um, so physical therapy after surgery, pain control, um, blood clots are a big issue, blood thinners, you wear stockings that everybody hates, um, and then the goal is to get moving. A couple things that have changed in the last few years. 
Um, we routinely don't do Foley catheters, so no bladder catheters anymore, unless there's a significant medical issue that requires it. And also for knee replacements, there's what's called a continuous passive motion device. So in the past, you'd get strapped to a knee bending machine, and for hours a day, you'd have your knee back and forth. We realize that's not helpful, and in some cases, that can cause more knee stiffness, paradoxically. So we don't use CPMs anymore. Um, ice is huge, and then the, the medication regimen that I talked about um, before. As I talked about briefly, discharge to home as soon as medically able and safe. Um, and the plan should be in place before surgery, not, hey, I'm going to have my knee replacement, and then I'll just figure things out afterwards. That plan ahead of time, and that's what the program here does a great job of educating people to what to expect after surgery and how to prepare families as well with that support network. Um, I mentioned with the physical therapy, um, day of surgery, if you're staying overnight the next day, and then outpatient physical therapy. Um, we try to avoid nursing homes and skilled nursing if possible. Um, we found that the complication rates for nursing home stays and skilled nursing is higher, and patients do better if they go home. And so obviously we want the outcome to be better, so we try to plan ahead of time to do that. Occasionally things will happen, there'll be a complication or some issue that patient will have to go. We don't plan that ahead of time. The whole goal is to get home, return to function, return to your normal life. So the risks. I mean, no surgery is perfect, even though we plan so hard, we try to minimize the risk. Um, infection is a huge challenge with joint replacements. We give you antibiotics, we wear spacesuits, sterile technique, but even then, infections can happen. If it's a skin infection, antibiotics work great. If it's a deep infection, it's a significant issue, because the infection can get on the metal and plastic that we can't get off. So uh, sometimes we go back to surgery to clean it out. Other times it requires two or three surgeries. Sometimes you have to go in, take the metal and plastic out, put antibiotic cement in, IV antibiotics for six weeks, eight weeks, and then go back in again. So you know, those risks are low, but they're there, um, and they, they happen. And so um, those are definitely concerns that we always have and talk about before surgery. Blood clots are an issue, even with potential, even with all our treatments. Um, stiffness with knee replacements are common. Not common, but they happen. With hips, it's not a big concern. With hips, we have issues sometimes with leg link discrepancy. Um, especially with hips, people often have a limp for a while because your hip's been arthritic, it's stiff, it takes a while for the muscles to get back. Um, occasionally people have permanent limps, but most of the time it's just a, a temporary issue. So tons of technology. This has really been at the forefront of uh, joint replacement. And bottom line, we're continuing to try to make our techniques better, make the implants better, make the outcomes better. Some of it's surgeon related, some of it's patient related, some of it's protocol with physical therapy. We're constantly trying to make things better. Um, research with trying to make the components look different. Maybe if we adjust the shape or the size or the way we put them in, then they may be better. So there's tons of research. Um, there's been a lot of uh, publicity about 3D imprinted knees, um, some hips as well, where you get a CT scan and you get a custom knee. Um, that's really not borne out as being any more advantageous or better than any other way. Um, computer navigation is another technique that we've used to try to improve, not necessarily the type of implant, but how the implant is put in. So we believe that if we put the implant in better, it will function better and last longer. And so that's the whole goal with navigation as well as robotics, is try to put the implant in in a better position to make it feel better, be more functional, and then last longer. Um, so computer navigation, essentially, you're using data during surgery using a computer, but the surgeon has control the whole time, that the surgeon can do whatever he or she wants using that data. Um, robotics, you're constrained by the robot, um, which has already had pre-programmed data and also landmarks during surgery to provide accurate information. Also, surgical approaches. Um, a trendy topic now is for total hips, getting the, the hip from the front or the direct anterior. So that's been a very trendy way of doing things. Um, people have good results with it. Again, most studies show long-term differences are zero. So the bottom line with all these technologies, there are pros and cons to everyone. Do what your surgeon does best and is most comfortable with. And that's one of those things you can have that conversation with, with your surgeon. Um, I use computer navigation. 
Um, just to talk a little bit about it, this is the main overall sensor um, that um, sits in the OR next to the, the OR table. And basically during surgery, uh, I'm able to look at the screen with data captured from the hip or the knee, and I'm able to adjust what I do in surgery with my implants, make adjustments within one millimeter or one degree, depending on what I think is best in that individual case. Um, and another benefit with computer navigation, um, similar to robotic as well, is there's less blood loss. Um, so that's been a benefit as well. Less blood loss and less pain because you're not having as much bleeding into the joint. So it's just an overall uh, general schematic of, of what it's like with the navigation. And this is a, a computer screen that shows these lines. And that's what I see during surgery. And I can adjust these sensors and these uh, components here to whatever I want. So if I want two millimeters, one millimeter, different angles that in surgery we can adjust um, to make the cut exactly, um, to make the implants fit uh, ideally for that individual patient. Because everybody's anatomy is different. We're constantly, every surgery, making adjustments based upon what we see in surgery uh, and the anatomy. And this is a similar schematic um, just for the hip. That uh, This is a sensor shown on the top part of the hip. And then this is a socket. And this is a sensor that I use to get data during surgery. And then this is a screen that's uh, attached to that monitor that during surgery, I can adjust the um, tools to get exactly what degrees I want um, in order to um, have whatever I think is best for that individual patient. Um, the implants themselves are, th are the same as the standard technique. It's just that they're inserted based on the computer navigation to get overall alignment. Um, this is unique to me in Cedar Rapids. Um, other surgeons across the country use it. And, and like I said, people have good results with whatever technique. I believe this is best for me um, in my experience. Um, you know, the, the benefit, you know, less, I think it's more accurate. And it shows there's more outliers, or less outliers. So you have, you know, 100 joint replacements. With computer navigation, they're more to the center where you want it to be than somebody using non robotic or non-navigated um, techniques. I and mean, then the blood loss is a big issue as well. Um, there's, because with using this, we don't have to use techniques that go inside the bone that cause more pain and more blood loss. So this is a, a great website. This is from the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. Um, this has a ton of information um, about a lot of different orthopedic conditions, not just arthritis or joint, re joint replacement. Um, so that's all the prepared content that I have. Um, as far as the components, um, they're in the back table. So this is the, the screen here. Um, Brock and Kyle from Stryker brought uh, some of the hip and knee implants just so you can see what it feels like, as well as some of the navigation um, instruments so you can get a, get a feel for, for those I as well. Um, but bottom line, it says, you know, I, I use navigation. Um, uh, doctors, surgeons use robots with great outcomes. People use traditional techniques with good outcomes. Uh, we're fortunate in Cedar Rapids to have many talented surgeons that do a great job, um, regardless of whatever technology they use um, to, um, to help do, give them the best outcome. But uh, I'd like to open it up for questions. Um, any issues or concerns? Yeah, go ahead. So it's a measurement of your weight versus height. So uh, it's body mass index. So if you're tall and thin, your BMI is low. If you're shorter and broader, it's, it's, it's bigger. So it's a way of adjusting your weight versus your height. It's not a standardized measure we use. And there's calculators on the internet. You can go to, to Google and BMI calculator, and you can input your height and your weight, and it'll show you what your BMI is. There's a higher risk of having a worse outcome. So we realize that there's a higher infection rate, higher blood clot rate, um, wound issues if your BMI is higher. Mm -hmm. So 35 is better than 40, 30 in general is better than uh, 35. Um, the interesting thing we've found is 
we, we we're starting to realize that if your BMI is too low, and that's not usually an issue in Iowa, but if your BMI <laughs> is too low, you can have the same infection risk as if your BMI is too high. So we're trying to find, because that usually means you're malnutritious, malnourished. You don't have the nutrition you need to fight off an infection. So we kind of want to get that sweet spot. How long would it be before a person might be able to, just, if they're used to taking a like, half-mile walk or something would it, of an evening, how long would, might it be before they'd be able to do that? After a hip or a knee? Knee. A knee. Um, probably eight, ten, 8 to 12 weeks. Yeah. But again, everybody's different. And the interesting thing that, I, that I've noted in my experience is, even though I may do the exact same surgery, people's recovery is different. And there's a lot of factors that go into it, and the majority of it is, is mental. Like how they deal with pain and how motivated they are to have a good outcome. Um, that I had some patients, they do a perfect surgery, and either they're not motivated, don't want to work with therapy, they just don't do as well, even though the x-rays look perfect, the surgery went perfect. So, so much of it goes into somebody's mental attitude and their motivation um, following surgery. We do do partial knees. It's a limited indication because for a partial knee, you're basically only replacing one side. And it's, it's hard to see, um, but let me see if I can show you on this. So this is a total knee where you place every surface that has cartilage. And a partial knee, you have isolated arthritis to maybe just the inside of the knee, which is the most common area. But the rest of the knee looks good. And so if you have just the inside of the knee that has arthritis, and the rest of the knee looks good, you can do a partial knee. The issue is, is not very many people have arthritis limited just to that area. So the danger is the risk, you do a partial knee here and leave everything else, well, what if you get arthritis on the other side in six months or a year? Exactly, so we got, we got a model of partial knee too. So the danger is then you have to go back in, take the partial knee out and go back in to put a, a total knee. Thanks, Jen. So this is a partial knee. Um, the partial is just the inside here this is the trochlea for a patellofemoral or just underneath. The normally, partially is just this part here. But it, if it's a candidate, if you're a candidate, it's, it's usually 5% or less overall. The recovery is quicker. Um, it feels more like a natural knee. That's what I tell people with, with total knees is, and even partials, it doesn't ever feel like a completely normal natural knee. It's metal, it's plastic, it clicks, it clunks. It's always a little more swollen, always a little more warm. What percentage of patients might be expected to get uh, antifactions? It's usually less than 2%. Hopefully it's down closer to 1% depending on if we've optimized everything before surgery. Sure. Sure. The question is what percentage should be expected to have an infection? And I said 2% initially. It's ideally less than 1% of getting a deep infection. And usually we find it as people that BMI is a little high. Sometimes you push the BMI, is it 38, 39? Or A1C is a little high. Um, sometimes it just happens. Sometimes everything went perfect during surgery, no issues, patient's healthy, and you still get an infection. So that's always, always the risk. Um, but uh, we try to do everything we can in the OR by our techniques and monitor things closely to prevent that from happening. It's the pressure, um, because you can have perfect motion, and we don't know exactly why, but it's more of a pressure phenomenon. And, and it's pretty common. It's not causing damage to the joint, but we see it. It's a very common complaint, people with knee replacements, especially people that like to, to garden or um, t lay tile or do anything down their knees, they have to use um, knee pads. But again, you're not doing any damage, but it's just a very common complaint that we see um, following knee replacement surgery. Dr. Bader, can you pull up your last slide so they can finish writing that Sure. Absolutely. That, that's, that's an excellent point. So the question was hip dislocation risk uh, in the newer techniques. And there are a few different things that have, we've done to improve that. Um, one is the ball is bigger now than it used to be. And because the plastic is better, we can make bigger um, ball for that. And so that decreases the risk of dislocation. Um, also, it's just the surgical technique that we do, um, whether you go in from the front, side, or back, the dislocation rate has gone way down 
because we repair anything we go in, if there, we, we have to take the capsule down, we repair that capsule where years ago we just cut it out. And so um, the dislocation risk is always there. The biggest concern we see with dislocation now in hips, people that have had spine fusions. And so it's a special category of patients that have spine fusions and have a hip replacement. We have to be very careful how we put the hip in because you're at more risk of having hip dislocation if you've had a previous spine, spine fusion. So we have some other techniques to help minimize that um, as well. Um, hip precautions, one thing I didn't, I want to touch on real quick. Um, in the past, there were a lot of precautions. You, know, you can't cross your legs, you can't sit in a recliner, you can't bend over. Um, some of it's surgeon dependent, but with most newer techniques, many surgeons don't have um, precautions. Uh, most people don't recommend running with hips or knees, but I do have patients that do that. I try to ignore it when they tell me that they do. <laughs> and, um, and, and the, the risk of that is it just, it's going to increase the wear. It, it's not going to explode or fall apart. It just increases the, the wear um, of the joint. Go ahead. Far in the back as well. For a hip replacement, how do you determine the front side or back? The optimal recommendation is whatever the surgeon does best. Because <laughs> there really, there's, there's pros and cons either way. Um, there's good outcomes, all, all techniques. And so, uh, you know, you don't want to push your surgeon to do a certain technique if he or she doesn't do that. What do you do best? Uh, I do anterior lateral. So it's a combination of anterior and the side. Um, basically, going from the side, and then you work your way across. Um, the benefit of that, and three of the four of us that do hip replacements in Cedar Rapids do it the same technique. Um, it's very trusted, very reliable, um, low dislocation rate, and great visualization. Because the goal is to be able to see the joint, to be able to put the joint in how you want it. Because you want it to last 20, 25, 30 years. And so if you can't see and you don't put it in right, there's no benefit to having a little bit quicker recovery if you're going to have to have a revision in two, three, four years. And so we all believe better visualization. We repair all the soft tissues, minimal muscle involvement. Um, so that, that's why we do anterior lateral. But surgeons go posterior, and they do great. There are surgeons that go anterior, and they do great as well. No. No. Occasionally, people do knees at the same time. Uh, it's extremely rare. I've never seen people do. I've heard of it, but I've never actually seen people doing both hips at the same time. Primarily, it's, it's more of a, a, a medical risk or physiologic risk to the body just by undergoing two fairly large surgeries. There's a little more blood loss with the hips, a little bit longer anesthesia time often. Go ahead. So with walking, um, oh sorry, um, what's the estimated time back to work? So for a total knee replacement, um, people that have purely desk jobs, I've had some people go back in two weeks for desk jobs. That's a little fast, um, but some people get bored at home and they want to get back to work. And, um, but typically for walking, probably six to eight weeks. But we're always willing to work with the patient and the employer to figure out what's optimal. If you can go, maybe go back and do half shifts or light duty or a combination. And so it's always a discussion we have with, with, with our patients in order to try to have the best outcome and best rehab. So you start out with the walker. How long hmm? do you use that walker? Or does it depend on the person? It depends on the person. Um, usually what we do is some people will be off in a week or so and go to a cane. Oftentimes we'll see the patient back in two weeks for the first checkup. They'll also see physical therapy about that time, and they'll have another evaluation by physical therapy just to see how the patient's doing with the walker. If they're doing great, it's like, hey, we're going to transition you to a cane, and then transition to a cane. So if you have your surgery, I have like four steps up into mm -hmm. my house. You can do those four steps. Yes. Yeah, before we let you go, you got to prove to physical therapy. Steps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they're the bosses. Like, if they say, <laughs> Dr. Painter, she's not ready, fine. I'm not going to say, no, you got to let her go. No. They're the bosses. If they say they're not ready, they're not. So we, we rely on that because we, we don't want you to go home quick and not have a good outcome. If you're safe and ready to go, you're, you're going to go. Okay. Yeah. But it's definitely thing we want to prove that you can do it. Go ahead. With um, knee surgery, are there ligaments, areas that are removed with the knee surgery? Um, meniscus, ACL? So we try to preserve as much healthy tissue as possible. Uh, the meniscus is part of the joint, so that always gets taken during knee replacement. 
Um, all the other ligaments, except for the ACL, are, are saved. So the PCL on the back, the MCL on the inside, and the LCL on the outside, those all stay. And we feel that the knee functions better and feels better the more natural tissues you have. So in most knee replacements, almost all, everything stays except for the meniscus, cartilage, and ACL. In the way the shape of the design, you don't need an ACL. Correct. Are those all off the menu now? Or I mean, I, I'm, I'm just curious, you know. Yeah, absolutely. So the question is about hip replacement recalls. And you'll, you'll see on the commercials, the, the lawyers are advertised about hip replacement recalls. And the biggest issue was the joint itself. And a lot of companies had this. It was metal on metal. So you had a metal ball on a metal socket. And it's like, oh, metal's going to last forever. It's, just, it's just not going to wear down very often. Well, what happens is the metal rubbed against metal, and you had ions that got into the bloodstream, um, which everybody with metal and metal hips had it. A lot of people did great. No issues and have gone on. You know, there's there's thousands thousands of patients that did fine. Some patients, their body reacted, and they developed too much metal ions in their blood, and they had tissue reactions locally, also some systemic issues. And so even though there were a small number, there were some significant issues. And so for the most part, most people in the United States say don't do the metal on metal hips or anywhere you have metal rubbing against metal. And so it's not to say that there could be something recalled tomorrow or a week from now. Like we're, we're, we're constantly reevaluating the data to try to make sure things are safe. Um, it's based on years and you know, lots of trials, but you never know. So that's why we're constantly reevaluating what we do. And one thing that's changed in the United States that has, is relatively new that other countries have done for years is a joint registry. So basically all the total joints we do, we send our data off to be analyzed by a national organization. Other countries have done this for years, England, Australia. Because of the legal nature and risk in our country, everybody was hesitant. Oh, I don't want to report my data because I don't want to get sued. Or a certain company said, hey, I don't want them to look at our data. Well, we've been doing that now recently. And it's really helped improve the quality of our implants because we see what implants do better, what do worse, which last longer. Um, and some of the data has been very helpful in, in planning future implants. Um, one of the interesting things about the, the data that we've seen is the higher volume the center and the surgeon, the better the outcomes are. So low volume surgeons, surgeons that do eight to 10 certain surgeries a year, their outcomes aren't as good. So the more this, the hospital does and the more the surgeon does, the better the outcomes are gonna be. Because um, the physical therapists are used to seeing that, that post-op patient, the anesthesiologist, everybody's used to seeing it. So having that volume is important. And that's, that's one of the benefits of, of being in a community and being at this facility that we do joint replacements every day here. That makes the outcome better. Can you wait too long to have a new replacement done? Not necessarily. For the most part, the surgery from my standpoint is going to be the same. Uh, it can get to a point, it's rare, where the deformity gets to be too bad that it changes the type of implant, but that's really rare. The big decision factor is your quality of life in the interim, if, if, if the, what you're missing out on. Um, is it possible that you could have a medical issue develop? That's always possible too. Um, but we did a knee replacement yesterday and somebody was 93. Wow. So wow. It's, it's more of a functional status and lifestyle. And if, if you're healthy and active and you've tried everything else, you know, that's, Again, that's not common, but those are those discussions we have. Same question for a hip. Is there a point where? No, no, there's not. No, it, again, it, it potentially could get to the point where it makes it a little bit harder for us, and, and I'll complain in the operating room. But, but, but sometimes the challenge is fun. Uh, but the overall outcome is, is going to be the same. It's just more of the, the quality of life from you know, when you had those arthritis Did symptoms. Back to the range and motion of the hip. Um, there's no limitations to your range anymore mm. at all. You can go beyond the 90. You can go as far as your good hip can go with your correct. Your artificial. Correct. So if you do yoga, you're, you're, you can hang in there with the best? Yes. That's what I'll say for, for my patients and a lot of patients. Some surgeons are st still not comfortable with that. A lot of us are. So you know, talk to your surgeon about the restrictions. Um, but with the technology and techniques, do what you feel comfortable doing. Um, it takes a while to get that range of motion back, though, especially with hips, because that hip's been so stiff for so long 
and all of a sudden you put a new fancy hip in that works real well, it takes a while for the soft tissues to catch up. So that motion increases over time. And you're not gonna be doing yoga you know, four to six weeks, but you know, eight months, 10 months, that uh, joint has loosened up and has had more stability. Yeah, go ahead. Everybody's different. Yeah, yeah. So, so the question is, <laughs> how long after knee replacement surgery are you pain free? And everybody's different, like I said. So oftentimes people may have little aches and pains, soreness, regardless of how good the surgery is. Um, but the pain is significantly better than, than what it was prior to surgery. Well, sometimes that maximum improvement doesn't occur for a year. So oftentimes very common people, to get frustrated, it's like, ah, oh, surgery is six, eight months ago and I'm not super happy. I'm a little bit sore after I walk two miles or three miles. I'm like, it's okay, just give it time. Um, it just, you know, the body just needs to, to help heal that. It usually happens a little bit faster with the hips than, than the knees. The knees just can be a frustration. And that's one of the things in orthopedics today that we're looking at is why aren't knee replacement patients in general as happy as hip replacements? Again, it's a very successful surgery, but we're looking at taking it to that next level where hips Satisfaction here, knees just not quite there yet. How many knee surgeries do you do in a year? Uh, total joint replacements, um, looking at about 350 this year. Uh, yeah, that's total overall. Um, 350, I, I probably do about 70% hips, 70 to 80. Do all the orthopedic people do knees? Uh, not everybody. Uh, more people do knees than hips. There are four of us that do hip replacements. Maybe seven? How do you think? Seven? Dan? Seven-ish? Seven, eight? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it, it, it depends. I mean, some of us do very, very numbers. Yes, sir? I get a new hip, would it help the knee? Yes, yeah, so that's an interesting, interesting question. So if, he asked if, if you get a hip replacement, does that help your knees? It's very common with people with hip arthritis to have knee pain. We'll see patients at least once a month that have had treatment for knee pain for years and their knee pain is not getting better. And all of a sudden we'll get a, a, an x-ray of the hip and it was hip arthritis all the time. If they didn't have hip pain, they had knee pain. So it's pretty common people will do a hip replacement and knee pain goes away. Not, not everybody, but it's a very, very common thing to see. Sure. Well, I was in your office this winter and you said I had bone on bone and I was about ready for a new hip. Hmm? Chickened out. <laughs> 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 but it's not pain. But it's aching. It hurts. Sitting here tonight, I'm ready to get up, get out of here. <laughs> but if I put a new hip, would it, would it help the knee? Oftentimes it does. One for just motion, but sometimes the hip, the knee pain, could be directly related to the hip. And that's an interesting. Because some people that have bad hip arthritis with zero hip pain, maybe some stiffness bad knee pain. It's just interesting the way the physiology works for some people. It can be tricky for us. I can say that everybody talks about pain. It's not pain. Mm -hmm. As I know, it's pain, but it's, it's aches. Yeah. And everybody's response is different. And that's why I say we always judge off your symptoms. Like we have people with horrible x-rays and some people like you. It's like, yeah, it's ache. Even your x-rays look awful, maybe. We don't make that decision based on the x-rays. We do it primarily correlating with the x-rays, but with how your symptoms are on a daily basis. Yes, sir, in the back. The plastic outside part, what type of plastic is that? It's called polyethylene. It's basically a highly processed plastic that's manufactured to have very good wear. Um, and it's been a newer technique or newer type of plastic um, that's been uh, utilized the last maybe know, five, ten years. Does it break down? It does break down. All plastic breaks down. But the newer plastics break down at a lot lower rate than the previous versions did. Yes, sir, in the back. Uh, how long a time between two knee replacements or two hip replacements? And the second question is, if you get an infection in the joint, how do you know that you have an infection in the joint? Okay. So the first question is the timing between the two surgeries. Um, with knees, it's rare, but occasionally we'll do both at the same time. Again, that's super rare. Most of the time, it's about four to six weeks at the soonest. But some of this is discussion with the patient. You know, if there's job constraints or lifestyle constraints, we will say, hey, or if we can do it 
four weeks rather than six weeks. Other people say, hey, you know what? I'm gonna space it out two months, four months. Um, it really just depends on, on the individual patient. And that's always a discussion that, that, that we have. Um, some people are school teachers and they wanna get both of them done in the summertime and say, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll knock them out so you can have good recovery, ready for school year or some other job. Um, other times we'll say, hey, we'll just space it out six months or a year. Um, the second question was, how do you know you have a joint inf infection? Um, sometimes it's obvious. Sometimes it's red, it's hot, it's swollen. It was feeling great one day. The next day, it's very painful, tough to walk. You have fevers, chills. Sometimes it can be subtle. Some joint infections can linger for months, even years, at a low, low level that you don't really know. It's maybe a little sore, a little achy. You just don't know why the joint's kind of painful. And so that's one of the things that we're looking at now, at trying to diagnose those low-level infections. Um, occasionally, we'll stick a needle in the joint to draw the fluid off to send to a lab that they've had new tests for. Um, other times, it's blood draws. Um, so it's, 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 it can be a challenging diagnosis sometimes for a, a, a low-level total joint infection. Sometimes it's from the joint itself. Other times, if you get an infection in your bloodstream, that infection can go to that joint from your bloodstream. Um, one of the things that we've done in the past is for any dental cleaning, we always had antibiotics for dental cleaning. Um, there's been a, a meeting with the dental leaders and orthopedic leaders in the country, and they've met and looked at all the studies and realized that unless you have a bad infection in your mouth or your bad uh, immunocompromised status like chemotherapy, AIDS, severe system, you don't need to take antibiotics for routine dental cleaning after the first six months of, from surgery. So that's been something for years that we always did just because. And now that we look at the studies, like, oh, well, maybe we really don't need to do that because it doesn't change the risk of infection. Question. Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, most of the studies show that it's not effective. I've had people, granted, there's anecdotal evidence from everybody. Some, some people love it. And so if I have a patient that says, hey, I take it, I like it, I don't, you know, just keep taking it. There, there's really low risk um, or no risk, essentially, unless you have a shellfish allergy. So, but as far as a recommendation, there's not enough data, and the American Academy backs it up to recommend it. But if you're on it and you like it, I'm not going to stop you. Not, not enough data at this point. Yeah, so going forward down the road 20, 30, 40 years, there's going to be more biologic treatments. And that's where all the research is now um, to be able to you know, go in and do a biologic surgery where there's not metal, not plastic, there's regrowing cartilage. There's, this is not there yet for, for a lot of reasons. And so um, it'll be great when it is, but it's just not there yet. Um, there's a lot of hope, a lot, a lot of optimism. Um, the thing that we see across the country that we're more concerned about is people that will use the marketing of stuff that's not proven or techniques that are not proven for financial gain. And there are a lot of um, providers that will do that, that will charge thousands of dollars for technology that's not proven and just use that for financial gain. So that's just something to be, be concerned about, that we want the data to support our techniques. No, so all, all the, the techniques that, that I mentioned, so it's, it's you know, the Tylenol, the anti-inflammatories for mild arthritis, the hyaluronic acid is, has been shown to be somewhat effective. Um, and certain types of platelet-rich plasma for mild arthritis are starting to show some promise. So I think that's gonna be the first phase for mild arthritis, some platelet-rich plasma. It's probably the first thing that's gonna be um, recommended for um, in the future. But it wants, we want it to be used responsibly, data-based and priced fairly not five, six, seven hundred thousand percent, five, six hundred uh, percent more than what it cost that physician to, to, to use it. Yes, sir? In the corner? What, uh, what kind of a time frame are we looking at, for example, you? If I decided tomorrow I won't make it to the Yeah. Some of it depends on, so the question is how long does it take? If, you, if I see you in the office tomorrow, when and you're a good candidate, when can you have surgery? Um, for a healthy patient, usually about four to six weeks. Um, if there are any medical issues, obviously those will take a little bit longer to evaluate and um, potentially treat. If somebody has a heart issue, sometimes we have to wait for different cardiac tests and we have to push uh, surgery back. But typically about four to six weeks. 
Yes, sir. If a person likes a walk, my wife, she likes a walk of an evening, <clears throat> but she has knee problems, and it just seems to me like this, uh, the more you walk a mile or something, it's just going to make the knee feel worse and wear it out sooner. I mean, that seems logical to me. What do you think? Mm -hmm. So the walking itself isn't going to wear it out sooner, but it may make the symptoms worse. So then the progression of the arthritis, if you actually look under the microscope, be the same, but the inflammation and the pain associated with it may be worse. Yeah. So it doesn't in a, in a wear out more, it just feels worse. Correct. Okay. Yeah, in general, so they've, they've done studies on marathon runners. People think, hey, you know, running distances may make it wear out faster. And so that's what I realized with osteoarthritis, it's not necessarily just wear and tear. There, there's other factors that, that go along with it. It's a pretty complex disease, or we used to think it was pretty basic wear and tear, but there's a lot to it. Yes, ma'am. Is the surgery center an option for having knee replacement or not? Yeah, so the question is, is the surgery center an option for joint replacement? Uh, and it is for a certain criteria, primarily um, based on health, because obviously you're planning on going home the same day. And so for patients that are healthy, um, have a good support system and be able to take care of the patient that day, um, it, it is an option um, to do um, joint replacement at the surgery center. In any case, you'd have the option to have it done in a hospital. Correct. Yeah, it's, it's always your option if you choose for the hospital, um, especially if there's medical issues or it's any preference. Yeah, we, we do surgeries here. Uh, you know, every Monday I'm here. Yeah. So yeah. how do you have to have somebody with you immediately after your surgery? I mean, if you live alone, um, what's the... Yeah, so the question is you have to have somebody with you all the time or directly after. Uh, usually somebody close by for sure. It would probably be helpful the first night have somebody staying with you, just to be sure. Um, but uh, it's not 24-7 constantly by your side. But especially the first day or two, because you're still able to walk. It's just you're not going to feel like you know, getting up to the kitchen to fix breakfast the next morning. But sometimes people have like somebody next door, a next door neighbor that can check in on them a few times or, or have a relative stay with them for a few days or just have a schedule. And um, the important thing is to have a plan. And that's why there's such great education ahead of time, just to realize what to expect. Thanks, guys.